to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Father, tonight we just thank you and praise you for what you've already done in this church service. God, it's so good to be in your presence. So good to feel your power, Lord, in this place as we praise and worship you, God. Thank you for what you've already done, God. Many have already been encouraged. Many have already been healed. Many have already been strengthened, God. Many have already gotten a word or a touch from you, God. And, Lord, we're just excited about that. But, God, we don't want to stop there. We want to keep going with you further, farther, God. And, Lord, we just thank you that tonight as we open up your word, God, that you would open it up to us. Open us up to receive it, Father. May we have eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. And may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves, but we would ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, Lord. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them, God. No time do do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building one kingdom, God, and that's yours. Lord, we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Well, tonight, as we approach the Word of God, I want you to get a hold of your Bible, if you have it with you tonight. Uh, If you don't, we'll put the verses up on the overhead for you. But get in the habit of bringing your Bible, get in the habit of finding out where the chapters and the verses are, dog ear it, mark it, do whatever you need to do to get back to it, because this is something that you're going to need to get into your life. And the more you understand it, then when you go through something or when you need to get back to a certain area, you'll be able to get to it. Tonight, I want to talk to you about continuing in consecration. Last week when we got together, we talked about the consecration movement, and and I believe Pastor Jim, as he ministered that message, really just kind of started something. And and, and a lot of us, you know, took some time out and kind of just rededicated ourselves, even though we're already Christians, even though we already know that we're, you know, going to heaven and that life is good and all that. But you know what? There's times that we need to, as a people, come together, set ourselves aside, and just devote ourselves over and over again. You know, we, we got to get ourselves back into that place with God, get ourselves into a place where we say, you know what, God, I'm already committed, but here I am again, God, just, just setting myself apart. And, and, and you know, it's interesting as you read the Bible, you find out that there were certain things that the nation of Israel, which is a picture in the Old Testament of what you and I are today, the nation of Israel did things over and over again. There was yearly things that took place. There was times and seasons. And in fact, every day in the morning and in the evening, there was a lamb that was slain. That's amazing to me to think about. And that means that every morning when we wake up, we should remember the lamb that was slain for you and I, Jesus Christ. And once again, we have a brand new day. There's brand new mercies for that day. And and it's an opportunity for you and I, once again, to commit ourselves to the things of God, to set ourselves apart, to consecrate ourselves for God's holy purpose. What does that mean? That means that we just set ourselves aside and say, Lord, I'm devoted to you. Yeah, I may be going to the job. God, yeah, I may be staying at home with the kids. Yeah, I may be going to college or I may be uh, back in school or whatever it is. God, I, I might be going to the marketplace or might be taking a trip. Whatever it is that you're doing, each and every day is an opportunity for you to set yourself aside for God's holy work in, in, in whatever it is that you're doing. You understand what I'm saying? So what, last week when we talked about the consecration movement, and, and many of us said, you know what, I'm ready. Uh, I want to just kind of set my heart aside once again, just set myself apart and and just kind of shake off the dust of the world and and, and just put myself in that place once again. And and tonight, talking about continuing in consecration, you know, often when we dedicate ourselves to the Lord, as we did last week, things come up in our lives that will try to take us away from the position and from the stance that we're taking for God. There are things that will raise itself up. You know, it's like the Apostle Paul was talking about, and, and, and he was talking about how, you know, he started getting these abundance of revelations and how he was going out and ministering. He was doing all this kind of stuff. And, and he says, lest I should be exalted above measure, a messenger from Satan was sent, a thorn in the flesh. Now, many times people fixate on what was the thorn in the flesh and what was, there's many ideas and opinions about that, and I even have my own. But listen, that's not what I'm thinking about tonight. Let, let me just give you an example of this real quick. Obed, would you just stand up for a second? This is my friend Obed. Obed is a, a great man of God here at The Rock. Been with us for a while. Now, Obed, right now, Obed, everybody can see Obed? You know why you can see him? Because he's exalted above measure. Obed took a stand right now. Everybody else is seated. Everybody else is, is all on the same level. But Obed is exalted above measure right now. 
And the devil, when the devil sees a Christian take a stand for God, and he sees somebody standing up for the things of God, all of a sudden he says, nope, you need to sit back down. You need to get down. You, you can't take a stand for God. And what does he do? He starts throwing those fiery darts, starts trying to take you out, right? A messenger from Satan, a thorn in the flesh was sent, lest he be exalted above measure. See, you and I, thank you, Obed, you can have a seat. Everybody give Obed a hand. You and I... When we take a stand for God, it's just like Obed standing up in the midst of the congregation tonight. All of a sudden, we're exalted above measure. See, Satan wants to keep you down. He wants to keep you just average, par for the course. He wants to make you just settle into a boring, mundane Christian life. If you're going to be a Christian, he, you know, he, he's mad about that, but he'll be okay if he can't get you back, if he can keep you ineffective, if he can keep you down. If he can keep you in a place of complacency and lethargy. See, the last thing that the devil wants is somebody standing up for Jesus, setting themselves apart, and opening themselves up, being consecrated unto God. Why? Because then he knows that they will be an effective Christian. And so we see pictures of this all throughout the Bible. In fact, we see in the book of Numbers... If you want to turn there with me, Numbers, you, we're going to start out in uh, verse 25, but i got to give you kind of the backstory. Nation of Israel, obviously, is traveling to the promised land. They've, they've rebelled. They've had, you know, thing after thing after thing come up. They've wandered in the wilderness, and now they're kind of starting on their way up to the promised land. And they get to the border of the Jordan River, and there they are next to a nation called Moab and Midian. And here they are. And these nations are trembling. These nations are shaking. Why? Because they heard about what Israel's been doing. Israel's started to have some victories. They, they defeated a king, and then they defeated another king, and then they defeated another king. And, and, and so they hear about all this, and they think, man, they, these people are like an ox that's just licking up the grass all around them. And so what do they do? One of the kings says, you know what, I'm going to get a prophet to come and to curse Israel. And so he calls up this guy, Balaam. Maybe you've heard about Balaam and how his donkey spoke to him. The reason why is because God told him not to go. And, and he went and asked the Lord a second time, should I go? And God said, well, just go. Fine. If you're going to be disobedient, if you're going to go after wealth more than you're going to go after the word of the Lord, just go. And so the angel's getting ready to kill him. And, and, and three times the donkey saves this man's life. And he's beating the donkey. He's kicking the donkey. And then God opens the donkey's mouth. You can read about that. In the book of Numbers chapter 22, and, he, and the donkey rebukes him, basically, the Bible says. It, it, it says he restrained the prophet's madness. Because he said, what are you doing? I, I, I'm just trying to save your life here, buddy. And his eyes are open. He sees the angel standing there. And he says, oh, my goodness, you're right. I, I was wrong. You know? And he says, okay, Lord, if you don't want me to go, I won't go. And he says, no, go up with him, but only say what I'm going to say to you. So here the, the wicked king's trying to get Balaam to prophesy and to curse Israel, but he can't. Every time he goes, the, the Lord puts a word in his mouth, and he ends up blessing Israel. Three times, in fact, he blesses Israel. And then the fourth time, he tells the wicked king, hey, here's what's going to happen to you in the days to come. And he gives him a prophecy about how Israel is going to overwhelm them and how there's going to be a leader that rises up. Really, it's a messianic prophecy that comes out, and, and, and he's going to crush the head of Moab. And I mean, just this, this king is just so frustrated, and finally he claps his hands together like, stop, just, just don't talk anymore, don't bless him, don't even curse, don't do nothing anymore. And so he sends him off. Now, we read later on, we think that the story's over, but we read later on that when the Israelites went in and attacked Moab and attack the Midianites, that they defeat these wicked kings. And as they defeat these wicked kings, they find this prophet, or really the, the Bible calls him a soothsayer, and, and, and they find him and they kill him along with these kings too. Why? Because he didn't go back to his land. See, he was from Mesopotamia, but he didn't go back to his land. He stayed there with the Midianites, and he counseled the Midianites how to get Israel to fail. Numbers chapter 25 tells us how they sent women in. This was the plan was that they sent women in to seduce Israel into sexual sin and then to get them to bow down to their idols. See, it, if Israel, the consecrated people, the holy people, the set-aside people could not be cursed, then the only way to get them into a point of being cursed or to fail was to make them do it themselves. And so he sends in women to seduce the men of Israel into what the Bible calls harlotry or Old King James whoredom, right? That's just an, a, a, one of those shocking words. And, he's, and so he sends them in and they bow down. And the Bible says that they join themselves to their gods. 
So tonight, what does this have to do with you and I? You say, Pastor Dan, that's a great Bible story. That's a wonderful history lesson. But what do we do? I thought we were talking about consecration, setting ourselves apart. I'm glad you asked. Because as we continue on in the story tonight, I believe that we're going to see how do we continue in consecration? How do we keep going with what we started with? And so, so we set ourselves apart. We set ourselves aside. We dedicated ourselves. We devoted ourselves to the things of God once again. How do we stay in that place? How do we not fall into that failure like the children of Israel did? How do we succeed? That's really what the story is about. The Bible says that all of the Old Testament stories are examples for you and I so that we can learn about how to live our life today based on what we see in them back then. Are you listening tonight? So tonight, how do we continue in consecration? A couple of things that I want to pull out of this story, and we'll go along and we'll read along and, and find out what the story has to say. How do we continue in consecration? First thing is that we got to light up our life. Light up your life or my life or however you want to write it down if you're taking notes. How do we continue in consecration? Number one thing, light up your life. Light up your life. Numbers chapter 25, if you're there, verse number four. Numbers chapter number 25, the, the women had coming in, the men had committed sin with them, join themselves to their gods. In Numbers chapter number 25, verse number four says this, then the Lord says to Moses, take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord. Look at what it says, out in the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. In other words, he says, I want you to take all the people that are the leaders that committed this sin, and I want you to slay them and hang them out up in the sun. Exposed for everybody to see. Why? That the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So what is God saying? God's saying, I want you to expose this deed. I want you to light it up. I want you to shine the light on it. Out in the sun, out in the open. Now there's a military term in our generation, kind of a new term, and I'm not in the military or don't really claim to study and that kind of stuff, but you know, just here in the different movies and things like that, and you see, see, you know, if you ever watch those things, you know, and, and, and you enjoy that sort of a thing, you know, they always are talking about light it up, right? Here comes the enemy, light them up, right? And and so what do they do? They all turn and boom, 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 they light them up. Right? Anybody know that term? Okay, a couple of you guys out there. And so if we're gonna continue in our con consecration when anything arises that's going to take it, us out we need to light it up are you hearing what i'm saying tonight you need to light it up and you say how do i light it up do i turn and shoot at it no you don't turn and shoot at it you light it up with the word jesus said my words they are life and my word is light and so i need you to expose these things i need you to speak the word of god when these things come against you just like the apostle paul here he is this messenger from satan this thorn in the flesh what does he do he goes to the lord and he's crying to the Lord, Lord, take this thing away. I, I just, I don't want to deal with this three times. And the Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you. And so now Paul says, well, I gladly boast in my infirmities. Why? Because when I am weak, then I am strong. What's he doing? He's lighting it up. He's speaking what God says. In my weakness, he is strong. His grace is sufficient for me. And you and I have to take note of that because anytime we start to get lifted up, anytime we start to set ourselves aside, anytime we start to devote ourselves, there's going to be things that arise. Things that come against us, things that try and pull us down. Maybe it's an old sin. Maybe it's a past thing. Maybe it's old friends. Maybe it's the old way. And it starts to come against us and starts to draw us away to entice us. And yet we are not to go away with that thing and join ourselves to it like the children of Israel did. No, we're supposed to light it up. We're supposed to say, uh-uh, no. The Bible says, be holy for I am holy. The Bible says... Flee youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You see, whatever it is that your situation is, whatever it is that you're struggling with, whatever it is that's coming against you, you got to get the word of God on your lips and light that thing up. Go after it. Take the offense. Take the aggressive side and put it out there. Expose it. Ephesians chapter 5, you want to hold your finger in Numbers 25. Turn with me to the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 5. New Testament, Ephesians, chapter number 5. We're going to read verse number 11 through verse number 13. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 11 says this. It says, and have no fellowship. Have no fellowship. Don't, don't, don't join yourself to. Don't hang out with. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather... Expose them. What does that mean? Light them up. 
Another word for expose, if you, if you have a Bible that has a little number one next to it, some of your Bibles might have that little thing. You look in the margin, and what does it say? It says reprove them or rebuke them. Call it out. It's really what it's saying. Verse 12, for it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. See, sometimes we fixate on the bad. Rather than getting ourselves into the word of God and speaking and declaring what the word of God has to say. Now look at this. Verse 13, but all things that are exposed, all things that are lit up, all things that are reproved are made manifest or appear, how? By the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. So what is he saying? He says, rather than hide, rather than shrink back in shame, rather than stay away from the light. No, light it up. Get into and get yourself into the place with God. Start to speak the word of God. Bring God on the scene. See, if the devil's on the scene and it's just you and the devil, you're going to get beat up. But when you bring God on the scene, Christ in me, hey, devil, I'm not alone. Why? Because he will never leave me nor forsake me. And the Bible says that this is that which has overcome the world, my faith. I'm an overcomer. I'm not a victim. I'm a victor. And you start to declare the word of God over your life, start to speak those things out of your mouth, and listen, it's going to light it up. It's going to change the world that you live in. So when sin raises its ugly head, light it up with the word. Don't, don't fixate on sin. and all, No, you start to light that thing up. Don't go in. Don't join yourself to it. Don't jump in. Second thing that, that we see out of this story, back to Numbers chapter number 25, how do we continue in consecration? Number one is light up your life. Number two is be passionate about God's passion. Be passionate about God's passion. What does that mean? That means that we love what God loves. What does that mean? That means that we hate what God hates. It means that we are so in love with Jesus that no matter what, hey, I'm sticking with Jesus. Jesus, you like that? I like that. You remember when you first met that special someone in your life? You started talking to them, and, and as you're talking, you know, you're talking on the phone for hours, and as you talk, you said, oh, wow, you like to go to, I like movies. Wait, 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 you like to eat? That's crazy because I like food. <laughs> this is so meant to be. And what is God saying? God is saying, if you're going to fall in love with me, then love the things that I love and hate the things that I hate. Did you know in the Bible it actually records things that God hates? You can find that in the Bible. People say, I thought you had a loving God. Oh, yeah, he is ultimately loving, loves people, loves them, just loving God. But listen, there are some things that God hates. And so if I'm going to fall in love with Jesus, I've got to love what Jesus loves, and I've got to hate what he hates. That means that when you love God, you'll love his ways. You'll love his people. Why? Because that's what God loves. But also that means that you're going to hate sin and you're going to hate every evil way. Why? Because that's what God hates. We see in Numbers chapter 25 this same thing, to be passionate about what God is passionate about. Love what he loves and hates what he hates. Numbers chapter 25, verse 6 through 8. Take a look at this. Numbers chapter 25, starting in verse number 6. It says, And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses... And in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now stop right there for a second. Can we go back to part A of that verse, guys? And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented. So what happened? Something got exposed. Presented to his brethren a Midianite woman. Now God has told the Israelites, I don't want you to intermarry with the people around you. I want you to wipe those people out as you enter into the promised land. And I don't want you to commingle. Now listen, in the natural, we would say, well, what's wrong with marrying? What's wrong with that, that intermarriage, that sort of a thing? I mean, didn't Moses have a wife that wasn't a Jew? I mean, it, it, it wasn't, wasn't his father-in-law, you know, Jethro, a priest of Midian? I mean, what's going on here? I, I, I'm not getting this. See, in the natural, there's nothing wrong with that. But when God says, don't, co-marry, then it's wrong. And especially when these women are worshiping other gods. If these women had joined themselves to Israel and they were going to worship the one true God like a Ruth, once again a Moabite, and who married Boaz. See, that's a different story. But these women were worshiping other gods and were drawing them away from God. 
And so that is evil. That's contrary to the ways of God. So here he is. He presented to his brother and a Midianite woman in the sight. Everybody say in the sight. Of Moses, the leader. This is the man of God. This is the prophet of God. This is the one who's leading them in the sight of Moses. So he didn't care about the leadership. And look at what else. And in the sight, everybody say in the sight. Of all the congregation of the children of Israel. So he didn't care what anybody thought. Here the people are weeping, part B. They're weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. These people are broken over their sin. You say, Pastor Dan, you've been talking about, you know, when stuff raises up its ugly head. Last week I presented myself to the Lord and already I messed up. Hey, listen, feel bad about it. Repent. Get the word of God. Ask God for forgiveness. Dust yourself off and keep going with God. That's what you do. Here's a people that are weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with their leader, Moses. But this guy doesn't care about Moses, doesn't care about the whole nation. I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and I don't care about any of y'all. Basically, that's what he said. Let's read the next verse. Verse number 7. Now, when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, so this is Aaron's grandson, when he saw it, everybody say saw it. See, he presented her, everybody, in the sight of Moses, in the sight of all the congregation. One man saw it. One man, Phinehas, Aaron's grandson, saw it. He rose from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. You say, Pastor Dan, this is getting bad. It's going to get real bad for this dude. Verse number eight, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel. What's, what's going on? Sometimes we wonder, God, why do you keep stories like this in the Bible? I mean, really, this is, this is kind of gross. This is kind of a weird story, God. I, I don't understand what you're saying. I want you to notice here is a young man. This is, this is Aaron's grandson. And Aaron's grandson sees something, and it so bugs him. Here's a guy who doesn't care about Moses, doesn't care about all the people. We're here crying before God. And this guy's going to come and present this woman that he's proud of? And so what does he do? He gets so angry that he goes and he grabs himself a spear, a javelin, and he chases those people into the tent. He goes into that secret place. He gets to the root of the issue. And he goes after that thing. And he thrusts it through, and it says at that moment, the plague was stopped. There were 24,000 people that died. But at that moment, the plague was stopped. Why? Let's read the next couple of verses. Take a look at the, uh, verse number 10. In verse number 11, God steps in and starts to say something that tells us what's happening. Verse number 10, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, verse 11, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel. Why? Because he was zealous with my zeal among them, so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. See, God was consuming the children of Israel. There was a plague that had struck out against Israel. Men and women were falling down dead. And the people are crying at the tent. They, they had gone to God. They had repented. Here they are crying before the tent of meeting. And here comes this one guy, so proud, still in sin, still oblivious, doesn't care what Moses thinks, doesn't care what the people think. And so Phinehas, the grandson of Aaron, sees this, gets so angry, and, and now all of a sudden the passion of God, what God hates, all of a sudden he is on fire for God, and he hates this thing, and he's not going to allow it to stay in the camp, and so he goes after it and takes care of it at the root of the issue. Now, church, you say, well, how does that apply to me? Listen, that thing that's raising itself up against you, you need to have the passion of God's passion on your life. When you see that thing raise its head, you go after it. You go, you get into the root of it. You get after that thing, and you take care of that issue. You uproot that thing at its base, and you make sure that it goes all the way to the root of the issue. Take care of that thing. Go after that thing. See, a lot of times people are getting beat up because they only have a half-hearted relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen, a half a tank of gas is only going to get you halfway there. But a wholehearted relationship with Jesus Christ is going to get you all the way to your victory, to your blessing, to, to what it is that you consecrated yourself for. 
And so if we're going to go the distance with God, if we're going to stay in that consecrated position, we've got to stay passionate. We've got to keep ourselves in the love of God. We've got to make sure that we stay after the things of God. Love what he loves, hate what he hates. Get the sin, get the stuff that draws you to sin out of your life. Do what it takes. That's what this is talking about. Revelation chapter 3, verse number 19, if you want to just look up on the overhead, Jesus is speaking, and he's writing a letter to a church, and he says, as many as I love, I rebuke. Now, to you and I, we say, man, God, my, my boss was really harsh with me. He rebuked me. He just called me out in front of everybody. Man, my dad, I don't know what, it's, what it is with him. He always put me on blast. And I had my friends, and, 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 and here he is, you know, at Thanksgiving, just put me on blast, and right in front of everybody, why has he got to do that? Here comes Jesus with a different thought. He says, as many as I love, here's the loving God, but what's the loving God do? I rebuke. Do you know what that word rebuke is? It's the same word that we saw in Ephesians chapter number 5, expose, reprove the deeds of darkness. So Jesus isn't going to leave you alone. He's not going to let you stay in sin. If you're his, if you're his child and you fell in the mud, he's not going to leave you in the mud because he loves you. Oh, I don't want to embarrass him. I, I, I don't want everyone to think that he's dirty. No, he's going to say, hey, you're dirty. Let's get you cleaned up. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, in other words, because God loves you so much and because God is going to put you on blast, hello, he's going to light up your life. Because of that, therefore, be zealous and repent. In other words, be passionate about the things that God is passionate about. If God is getting his finger on an issue in your life, it behooves you to pay attention, to listen up. When you're in church and you say, I, I just don't understand why the pastor is reading my mail. This is uncomfortable. I don't know why God is, it, it, it is just, it, it feels like I'm naked in the middle of this room right now. And what is God saying? God's saying that that issue that I've got my finger on right now, nobody knows about it except me, really, and anybody that you know that, that you've told or anything like that. But listen, it's not about that. This is about me correcting, me changing, me cleaning you up. Therefore, be zealous. Be passionate about my passions. Go after the things that I'm going after. If we're going to stay in that consecrated position, then, then, then pay attention. Listen up, church. Come on, it's time to take this thing seriously. It's funny because um, Wednesday night, my wife and I were up here, and, and we had a great communion service, and we were talking, and she was kind of joking around a little bit. I like to joke around, but she, you know, when it comes to the, you know, business, I, I'm strictly business. She's, you're so serious. One of the guys at the back door said, you know what, when, when she said that, it just lit up on the inside of me, and he said, I, I, I need to be serious about the things of God because it's easy to get distracted, easy to get off, and just that little thing just spoke to him. And so here it is. He says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Make sure to put a priority on the things that God is putting a priority on. Can you say amen? amen? God lights you up because he loves you. wants the best for your life. Final thing for tonight, if we're going to stay consecrated, how do we do that? How do we stay consecrated? How do we continue in our consecration? Number three is be hostile towards anything that will pull you away. You say, what does that mean? That means don't put up with it. That means be mean to it. That means if you've got to be bold and blunt, and yes, if other people may see it as rude, then that's what you got to do. Now, I'm not telling you to be mean, and I'm not telling you to be rude because love is patient and kind and is not rude. It does not envy, all that kind of stuff, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. However, when you take a stance and you're hostile towards something that's sinful, it's going to come off as rude. But you don't need to apologize for that. You need to... Take that stance with the things of God. Let me show it to you in the Word, okay? You'll understand what I mean here. Back to Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 25. Last couple of verses. Numbers chapter 25, verse number 16 through verse number 18. Look at what God says. Numbers chapter 25, verse 16 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, verse 17, Harass the Midianites. Have you ever thought about God telling Israel, I want you to harass somebody. Harass the Midianites. What does that mean? Old King James says, vex them. In other words, go after them. Be 
mean. Sometimes we say, I don't want to be mean. I'm, I'm not mean. That's not, my, that's not my way. I'm not supposed to be like that. But yet God is giving a commandment and he's saying, listen, these people enticed you to sin and you joined yourself to their gods and there was a plague that came out from among me to consume you because of it and now you want to be nice? No, harass them. Go after them. Vex them. Look at what he continues on to say. Harass the Midianites and attack them. For they harassed you with their schemes by which they seduced you. In other words, just don't put up with that garbage. If the devil comes at you, you come at him twice as hard. That's what he's saying. Don't put up with that. Devil, you come. Oh, my goodness. I may have gotten knocked down, but I'm going to knock you down twice as hard. I may have gone back a step, but listen, I'm going forward two more steps. See, that's what this Christian life is all about. Each and every one of us is there. Listen, I may be a pastor, and you've heard Pastor Jim say this, you've heard us say this, but I'm no more anointed to live this than I am to preach. I may be anointed to preach this. I may be preaching a good word tonight. You may be going, yeah, Pastor Dan's got it all together. Listen, I do not have it all together. Just ask my wife. Just ask me. I don't have it all together. Listen, I don't have all the answers. Not perfect. No one's perfect. The only one who's perfect is Jesus. We're all in this together. We're living this thing out. We're walking the walk together, learning how to do life God's way. And so when you and I mess up, when we fall back, when, when, when our devotion is now detoured or delayed or a little bit diluted sometimes, we've got to shake ourselves. We've got to shine the light on it, be passionate with God's passion, and not shrink back, but no, move forward. Go after it. Go on the offensive. Harass them. Harass the Midianites and attack them. For they harassed you with their schemes by which they seduced you. In the matter of Peor, in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of the leader of Midian, their sister who was killed in the day of the plague because of Peor. Now, Cosby, okay? Not Bill Cosby. This is Cosby, all right? And, and, and this is the name of the woman who the Israelite man presented in front of Moses and in front of all the children of Israel that later Phinehas went and put a javelin through. Her name was Cosby, okay? You say, why is that important? Why is that kept in the Bible? I was sitting there reading this, and I'm thinking, man, and, and actually, if you read through all of Numbers chapter 25, we didn't read through it all tonight just for time's sake, but she's mentioned twice in this chapter, two times. Her father's mentioned a couple times in the Bible, and I'm thinking, what is so important about this girl? Well, number one, she was the daughter of one of the rulers of Midian. Now, remember, Balaam had gone to the rulers of Midian and had counseled them on how they could get Israel to fall right? Send women in. So here's one of the rulers listening to the counsel of Balaam, the mad prophet, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, the Bible says. And, and so he's listening. And so what does he do? He sends his daughter to go and seduce Israel so that they will fall when they join themselves to the foreign gods. Why is that recorded for you and I in the Bible? Here's why. You know what Cosby means. It means a lie. It means a lie. The number one way the devil is going to get you to fall is he's going to send his little daughter. He's going to send a little lie to your life. Going to look good. Going to look like the right thing. Going to sound right. Going to smell good, right? And it's going to entice you to sin, right? LSD in, in the book of James, lust, sin, and death. That's the process that we see. Starts with lust, starts with that desire. Oh, you know what? It's okay. I can just have one more drink. Not a, not a big deal. Uh, you know what? It's all right. Oregon and Washington made it legal. I, I guess not a big deal. Oh, you know what? Times are changing. I, I guess it's okay. Oh, oh, you know what? Medical science says, and yet it's a lie. And the devil's enticing us away from certain areas of truth. And if he can get us to believe the lie and to join ourselves to that lie and enter into deception, deceiving ourselves, then we'll take ourselves out of that consecrated position. And now we'll no longer be on a road to success and victory, but now in a place of failure. So he sends that lie. But God says, hey, once you figure out that it's a lie, once you come to your senses, once you realize, then repent and return. Child, light it up. Once you realize what that thing is, once you realize the lie that you were believing, light that thing up. Get the truth. Don't believe the lie. Believe the truth. Don't speak the lie. Speak the truth. Get a hold of this thing. Light it up. 
And then after that, be passionate about the things of God and then finally be hostile towards anything that will pull you away. See, the lie is that sin's going to benefit you. But the truth is, is that it won't. It'll take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. I want to close with a verse tonight, Jude chapter 20. Jude chapter 20. And it's kind of funny because, you know, anytime a preacher gets up, he wants to be, you know, loved by everybody and preach an amen, shouting message. We all want to do that. I think I've heard Pastor Luke say that before, and I know I feel that way. And here's Jude at the beginning of the book. He says, I wish I could have wrote you a hoorah letter where we're all excited and all happy and write to you about our mutual faith, but I had to warn you about some things. As Jude concludes his letter, Jude is just one, one big chapter, one big book, so you won't find chapter one, chapter two, just Jude, verse number 20 through 23. There, right before the book of Revelation. You find Revelation, the maps go back to the book of Jude, right before that. Jude chapter one, or just Jude, verse number 20 through verse number 23. Take a look at what it says. Jude, verse number 20 says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. See, sometimes we want everybody else to keep us in the love of God. We want God to keep us in the love of God. God is saying, you have to stay in this position. Keep yourselves in the love of God. God always loves you. His love is always available for you. But there are some things which God hates that he needs you to stay away from. Keep yourselves in in the love of God, look at this, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. See, we've got to stay after this thing. We've got to give interest to it. We've got to give attention to it. Look at verse 22. And on some have compassion, making a distinction. Verse 23, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Now look at the last part of this verse. Hating. Everybody say hating. hating. Oh, come on. Everybody say hating. hating. Hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. What does that mean? A garment is something that you wear, something that you put on, something that people see you in. And he says, if it gives the wrong appearance, you need to get rid of it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says, don't even give the hint of evil. Old King James says, don't give any appearance of evil. Here Jude says, hating even the garment of Defiled by the flesh. In other words, if it looks wrong, you aren't going there. Not going to put it on. Not even going to do it. That's what you and I have to think about. Tonight I was getting ready. I was getting dressed. I was getting dressed. My wife bought me a shirt and a sweater, and she was thinking about me, wanted me to look cute and all that kind of stuff. And so I said, okay, cool. Thank you, baby, you know. And so I start putting on the shirt. And and the shirt's one of those slim fit shirts, which I'm okay with. You know, I'm, I'm not... Big bulky guy, so, you know, that'll work for me, all right? So I put that on, then I put on the sweater, and the collar's all the way up here at my ears, and so I pull that down, and then all of a sudden the sweater, and I'm I'm just doing like this, right? And I'm kind of doing that, 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 you know, all of a sudden I'm doing Michael Jackson moves, and I'm going, what is going on? This thing doesn't look right. Just doesn't look right, right? So, right, just take, just let's start over, let's hit the reset button, and I came out with this on, all right? So, anyways, I'm not calling attention to what I'm wearing tonight to make you think that I I, I want your approval based on what I wear. Rather, what I'm saying is, if the shoe don't fit, don't wear it. Come on. If it's not right, see, Jesus said, what what fellowship has light with darkness? What communion has light? The Spirit of God with Belial or a demonic spirit. See, they join themselves in the book of Numbers to a foreign God. We don't have any fellowship with the deeds of darkness. And if you are wondering whether or not I should enter into this thing, is it really wrong for me to go to the bar? Is it really wrong for me to have that drink? Is it really wrong for me to hang out with these people? God says, I want you to see how that thing fits. And if it doesn't fit, if it gives the wrong appearance, then don't wear it. Can you say amen tonight? A couple of things that we learned tonight about continuing in consecration. How do we continue in consecration? Number one, light up your life. Man, expose those things. Speak the word of God over your life. Get it, the truth in there. Second thing is be passionate about God's passion. My goodness, love what God loves, hate what God hates. Final thing is be hostile towards anything that will pull you away. Don't allow that thing in your life. Hating even the garment, even the appearance of something that's wrong. If you got something from the word of the Lord tonight, come on, give God a great big praise. But I want to speak to some of you guys before you go. I want to talk to you about your eternal life. I want to make sure that if you died tonight and this was your last, last night on the earth, 
that you would go to heaven and not go to hell. You know, tonight that message was in your face. It was blunt. It was bold. There was some stuff in there that was really shocking, honestly. Sometimes when we come into the house of God, we don't want to talk about certain things. Hell is one of those things. Sometimes people say, well, you want to talk about hell and heaven? You know, I, I understand heaven's all good and all that kind of stuff, and God's loving and everything. But, you know, hell, I can't understand how a loving God would send somebody to hell. Listen, God doesn't want to send us to hell. God's not this crazy, maniacal man up in the sky who takes pleasure in that. In fact, the Bible says God does not take pleasure in the death of the unrighteous. God's not happy when people go to hell. Hell was never intended for you and I. It was made for the devil and his angels who rebelled. And yet you and I can choose it by our life. And so tonight, let's talk because hell is a very real, pl real place. And, you know, sometimes people say, well, Pastor, I don't believe in hell. Well, it's a real place. Old Testament, New Testament talked about it. Jesus talked about it. Therefore, hell is a very real place. And just by denying its existence doesn't make it any less real. So you're going to have to face it sooner or later. Why not tonight? Why not find out how to get to heaven so that you don't have to end up in hell? What makes you think? that you're on your way to heaven. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I think I'm going to go to heaven because, you know, I was a good person all my life, done a lot of good things, and, and you know, been really good, been nice to my neighbors and that sort of a thing, and, and all roads lead to heaven anyways, and, you know, God lets good people into heaven, so I've been good enough, and I'm going to get there. Problem with that thinking is that, did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can be good enough to get to heaven? Like, be this good or do this many good deeds be more good than bad, and then God lets you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. God is not some jolly old Saint Nick in the heaven who's making a list of who's been naughty and nice. It's not how this works. Not going to get to heaven just by being good. In fact, the Bible says your goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags. You're going to be thrown out. Not going to make it if you think you're going to get to heaven by being good. And did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that all roads lead to heaven? It doesn't work like that. You can't get to heaven your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. Got to get there God's way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Now, at that point, you might be thinking, well, hey, wait a second, because I was, I was raised in church. Parents took me to church as a child, told me we were Christians growing up, had me baptized or christened as a child, hung a cross for St. Christopher around your neck, took you to religious classes, Sabbath school, Sunday school, catechism class, and, and, and born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven, Right? We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven. But the problem, once again, with that thinking is that, did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're raised in church, your parents tell you you're Christian, that makes you Christian? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're baptized or christened as a child, wear religious jewelry or attend religious classes, that you get to go to heaven? And again, I don't see anywhere in the Bible that it says that because you're born in America or that because you're not some other religion that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. If that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, then tonight, let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Tonight, I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. Come on, listen up. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, pastor, you know, I, I, I think I'm going to go to heaven, not only because I went to church as a child. Here I am sitting in church tonight. I'm sitting right in front of you. Doesn't that make me a Christian because I'm sitting in church tonight? You know, that's like standing in your garage and saying, that makes me a car. Here I am in my garage. I call myself a car, therefore I'm a car. Listen, it doesn't make you a car. You can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. You say, but, but wait a second. At my last church, I got involved. I helped out. I sang in the choir. I carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I, I even got a membership card to that church and taught in the Bible classes. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. But could you show that to me in the Bible? where it says that you help out, you get involved, sing in the choir, make decisions. People think of you as a leader, carry the pastor's Bible, or because you teach in the Bible classes that you get to go to heaven. It's not there. It's not there. Check it out. Nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere. Nowhere does God say that he's standing at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates. It doesn't work like that. Come on. Come on. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, ah, I got you on this one. Someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I know about Jesus. Celebrate Easter, about to celebrate Christmas and sing the songs. I do every year of my life, and I, I've memorized scripture. I could quote it to you. Old and New Testament. I know God. It's great. Once again, I'm glad you can do those things, but 
Have you read your Bible? Because if you had, you'd know that the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible records the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures, and yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven denying hell. So everybody look up at me for a second. It's not about what you have in your head. It's not about having some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is. And that gets you right with God headed for heaven and denying hell. Not about head knowledge. Rather, this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. In fact, Jesus said it like this to a religious leader of his day. He said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Didn't tell him good deeds. Didn't tell him be raised in church. Didn't tell him get involved. Didn't tell him no God. No, he said, you must be born again. Again, and it's no different for you and I today. You say, but I've heard about that being born again stuff. That's weird. That's crazy. I, I don't want that. Well, listen, the reason why you think that is because you've been watching movies, television. You've been reading books and magazines and internet stuff about being born again. But it's not about what society or media says about being born again. This is about what the Bible says about being born again. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, the third chapter. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he talking about? What, what is lukewarm? What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say look out? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, come on, your call, your choice. In a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to go just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Dan, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. But get over that. Why do I say that? Because think of the trade-off for a moment. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Come on, a moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? Come on. Mm -mm. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up, count it, you put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than being in hell forever. But he also said, if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, you're called your choice. Sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right. Or you can acknowledge your need for Jesus by simply raising your hand. See it go up, I'll count it, put it right back down. Hey, we've all done this in some form, some fashion at one time or another. We're excited for you to do this tonight. There's no shame, no condemnation, no one's judging you. We're excited for you. We want you to do this. So hey, you can be confident knowing that this is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Now who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand? You've never done this. Never given God all your heart and life. Come on, I'm speaking to you. You can do that tonight. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, you can make a right relationship with Jesus Christ tonight. Tonight is your night of salvation. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at watching by television, in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe, come on, you can raise your hand and then tell an usher or come into the church service right afterwards. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two. Three, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Raise them up high. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four. Thank you. There's five. Thank you. There's six, seven in that family room. Gotcha. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? There's seven on this side. Where are you at? Over here, seven. Anybody else real quick? I got seven wise people already. Seven. I got them right there. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Seven wise people. Eight. Got you right here. Anybody else real quick? Come on. I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? I'm, I'm looking over here because they all raise their hands over here, so... I'm kind of thinking maybe there might be someone over here that you, you know God's tugging on your heart tonight. Come on. Come on. Don't resist them. Thank you. Got you, number nine. We're at number 10. We're at number 10. 10, you're sitting there wondering if you should do this. You should. Come on. Go for it. Go for it. 
If that's you, you know God's tugging on your heartstrings tonight. Come on, don't resist him. Anybody else real quick? There's nine wise people already. Number 10, come on, come on. Come on, will you give them all of your heart? Will you give them all of your life? Real quick, come on, number 10. Don't get up and leave. Thank you, number 10. All right, come on, let's praise the Lord for 10 wise people tonight. Praise God. Here's what I want to do. All 10 of, you, 10 of you, or if you're number 11, number 12, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Hey, it's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're all going to give a clap and a shout. As we do, I don't want anybody to leave, all right? It's very hard to get people to come forward when you're going that way, okay? Because they'll just follow you out the aisle and out the door, all right? We want to get people coming this way because we want to change destinies tonight. But we can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand. Come on. It's not too late for you. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. You just come. Let's stand and welcome them. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. You're all I ever needed. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You're all I want. From the family rooms, you want to bring your kids. Come on down. Come on down. Get your kids. They'll remember this. Else if you need to come, come on, just make your way to the front. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. Come on, you can come too. We'll wait for you. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. It's all right. Come on down. All right, all right. Hey, everybody up front, take a look up here. Put a big smile on your face. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing, okay? All right, you didn't go to a funeral. You're coming to a birthday celebration. And you know what? It's your birthday. You're going to be born again, brand new on the inside, all right? Now, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. This guy over here in the cool shirt, that's Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? You know, listen, you already got past me, all right? It's cool from here on out, okay? He's going to do three things with you. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance, okay, so that you're not wondering, not afraid. Number one thing he's going to do is he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do, give you some free stuff, okay? Little booklets that our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Third thing he's going to do, he's going to introduce you to a friend. We call them spiritual personal trainers. Sort of a physical trainer at the gym helps you get strong, helps you get buff, right? A spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. Basically, it's a friend in church who will come alongside you for a couple weeks, help you to learn some things out of the Bible, but help you get strong in the ways of God so that you don't go back serving the devil, but you go on with Jesus, okay? And, and he'll describe how that works, and then he'll let you come right back out, okay? Now, your friends and family will wait for you. You need to do this. You need to get an SPT. It's free, it's easy, and it's good for your life, okay? Now, I'm going to make a promise to you guys right now. Here's a promise. Give us one year here at this church, sitting under the teaching here at The Rock, okay? Just a year of your life. As you come faithfully, consistently, we talked about staying in tonight. Remember that message that we just heard? Stay in the church. Give us a year, and for the rest of your life, you'll look back on that year and say, my goodness, I didn't realize that it could be this way. I am just so blessed. God's going to do great things in your life. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah.